Uh, he is uh, the owner of the Battles Bookshop in Boston. He's traveled a long way to get here. And his speech is on the value of old and rare books. So I hope the books you brought are old and rare. It's funded by the Bernstein Historical Commission, sponsored by the Bernstein Historical Society. And he does frequent appraisals on Andrew's Roadshow. I saw him last week. It was a repeat, but he did break down. So <laughs> if you recognize him, that's probably fine. And um, Ken has received the Yankee Magazine Editor's Choice Award for Best of New England. He also, in this year, um, it's the 68th year that the Gloss family uh, were owners of this Brattle book shop. And uh, he's been the sole owner since his dad's death in 1985. He's a contributor to um, the annual auction for WGBH, often a guest on Boston's WBZ radio. He's made television appearances in other places. And uh, the recipient, his shop, the recipient of um, best, several Best of Boston Awards. And uh, he's been, he is a member of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America, the International League of Antiquarian Booksellers. He's on the committee for the Boston Inter Antique Book Fair and Boston Society. He's a fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society and is on the board of overseers of the USS Constitution Museum. So please give Ken Gloves a well warm up. Thank you. I, with the poll, I'll move a little like that. Like that but, uh, what I do in a talk, the talk will last about 45 minutes to an hour. The first half hour, I'll talk about what is an old book, first editions, show off some of the things that I brought, uh, give a little bit more of the history background of the store, and then uh, I'll uh, do some uh, stories and anecdotes. After that, because I can go on and on and on and on about old books, I like to do question and answer. At least then I can go on what you want to listen to for about 10 or 15 minutes. The last minute or two of the talk, I will appraise one or two books from the audience to the whole audience in detail. After that, I'll end the formal part of the talk. I'll stay here. I'll do any and all appraisals. I'll just do them a lot more quickly. Uh, I wanted to go home. I, wanted to go home. Uh, I guess the first thing that comes up when you talk about old books is what is an old book? And usually people mean by that what's a valuable old book. Well, the first printed book was, was in 1456, the Gutenberg Bible. If any of you have a Gutenberg Bible, let me assure you that it's valuable. Matter of fact, the last one to sell was a number of years ago. Half of it sold for five and a half million dollars. Single pages sell between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars on average, and some even more. But any book printed in the 1400s is valuable. Some more than others, but anything in the 1400s. After that, it depends on what the book is. You can have a book printed in the 1500s that was a relatively dull and an interesting book then. And it's still a relatively dull and an interesting book now, and nobody cares or will pay anything much for it. On the other hand, you can have relatively recent books. The first edition of the first Harry Potter book in London, which is only about 20 years old, can sell for thirty or forty thousand dollars. Uh, it's all what people are looking for and what you want. And when I talk about old books, People will come up and say, I have an old book, and I know it's an old book, and the way I know it's old is the pages are all brown and crumbling. <laughs> well, I point out that's more lousy paper than it is how old the book is. Now, this is a page from a book. Uh, I'm going to pass this around. Most of the things I pass around tonight, uh, uh, some of them are small. If you want to see them, they'll be up here at the end. But you'll see it's not terribly fragile. The paper's white, the ink's black. It's one of the uh, first books done with illustrations. It was printed in the 1490s. So this page is a little over 500 years old. And you sort of say to yourself, why don't I start it there and then? Uh, you sort of say to yourself, well, gee, if they could make books like that then, why don't they do it now? 
Well, there's a big disadvantage to a book like that. First of all, in the 1490s, you're going to be quite wealthy to get an education to learn how to read. You want to be almost nobility to be able to afford to buy a book like that. Nowadays, maybe the books aren't quite as well made, but they're at a price that can be distributed in the millions. And the real value of books is the knowledge in the books and the dissemination of that knowledge. And I think it's a very good trade-off. Also, when you talk about book collecting, somebody will come up and say, I have a first edition. How much is it worth? And I point out that most first editions never came out in a second edition, probably never should have come out in a first edition. <laughs> Nobody cares or will pay whatever. Usually a book has to be historically, scientifically, literarily, or for some other reason important, that there are a group of collectors out there who want it. And usually when you think of first editions, you think of literature. Dickens, Twain, Faulkner, Fitzgerald, Hemingway. And even within that, there are a lot of things that can make a dip big difference to the price. The condition being one of the most important. The paper dust jacket on a 20th century book <coughs> can make all the difference in the world. <coughs> My father had a copy of William Faulkner's second book called Mosquitoes absolutely pristine, as if someone took it from the publisher, sealed it away. At the time my father got it, he sold it within a week for $750. Another book dealer had the same book, Mosquitoes Fault, the first edition, but it didn't have the paper jacket, had a few tiny little nicks and bumps, nothing terrible. It took them a year to sell it at $40. There's a lot of collecting is prestige. It's fair to say, look what I have. I have the best. I have the most wonderful. Essentially, I have what you don't have. And people who can afford it will pay absolute top dollar for the very best, but might not consider spending anything at all for something slightly less. Other things that can affect the value, signed by the author. Well, once again, if the author is unknown, unheard of, the fact that it's signed doesn't mean that much. Maybe one of your relatives wrote a book of poetry, had 50 copies, signed it, gave it to family members. To your family, that might mean an awful lot. Doesn't add much to the price. On the other hand, if it's signed by someone famous, maybe Ernest Hemingway, that could add hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to the value. And every type of collecting that you get into, there are nuances that add or subtract to the value. And I use sign books to show that off. There are some authors that are almost impossible to get their signature. J.D. Salinger, for instance, who wrote Catcher in the Rye. He was reclusive. He lived up in New Hampshire. He didn't appear in public. Essentially, didn't publish anymore. And other than to a very close personal friend, absolutely would not sign a book. Thus, his signature adds thousands of dollars to the value because you just can't get them. There was an author uh, more in the Boston area, New England. He wrote wonderful ghosts, sea, buried treasures, pirate stories of the New England coast, named Edward Rose Snow. Now, he was a friend of my father's, and I knew him. And I remember one day he came into the store, and he told us he had just been on Cape Cod. And he had gone into a bookstore that he had never been in before. Snow went right up to the section where his books were, pulled one off the shelf, opened it up, and exclaimed, my, a rare, unsigned copy. And then he took out a pen and signed it. And then he introduced himself to the owner of the store. So books signed by Edward Rose Snow don't add much to the value. There's so many of them. Uh, my father had a copy of F. Scott Fitzgerald's classic, The Great Gatsby. Now, just opposite what I was saying before, it didn't have a jacket. It was well worn and red. But when you opened it up, it was inscribed to the greatest living poet, T.S. Eliot, sincerely F. Scott Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to that inscription, when T.S. Eliot read the book, he made marginal notes, annotations, comments, crossed things out, added things into just about every page. That book now would be worth two, three, maybe even $400,000 because of the association. Uh, one last story about autographs. There was an autograph in manuscript dealer in Massachusetts. He was one of the most prominent in the world. But when he was a young boy, he used to collect books by Robert Frost. And he knew Robert Frost. And when he was 13 years old, he went to London. And he bought a copy of Frost's first book called The Boy's Will. It's very complicated what really is the first edition. In any case, 
He paid a lot of money for it, came back to Massachusetts. A few weeks later, he met with Frost. He was very proud of himself. He says, look what I have. And uh, Frost looked at it and said, well, what did you pay for it? He told him. And Frost said, give me the book. Frost opened it up. The front two end papers were a two-page description of how to tell the first binding from the second binding from the third binding from the fourth, how they change bindings, why they change bindings, the different colors of the bindings, on and on and on for two pages, signed it, closed the book, handed it back to the boy, and said, now it's worth what you paid for. <laughs> uh, in any case, let me digress a little, give you a little bit of my background, the history of the store. The history of the Brattle Bookshop goes back to the 1820s, but for all practical purposes, it was going out of business in 1949. My father was getting married. My mother had $500. With that, they bought half interest in the store. And it's always been in Boston. People are in Harvard Square on Brattle Street saying, where are you? We tell them we're downtown. When my parents first bought the store, there was a little side street in what was Scully Square called Brattle Street. To make it even more confusing, the street doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> it's where Boston City Hall Plaza is now. Uh, now, obviously, we're the most famous business that's ever been on the street, but there was this one called Radio Shack that also started. <laughs> there, but, uh, they, they're not doing as well. Uh, in any case, but we've had seven different locations over the years. Uh, we're mainly due to urban renewal, uh, but every time my father would move, when it was a planned move, he would move the best books over to the new location. Then he'd run sales, half price, dollar, 50 cent, quarter, dime. Last day of the sale, though, everything was free. And he would literally have hundreds of people line up with bags, bags, satchels, whatever. He'd ring a big bell. They'd go charging into the store, grab whatever they could grab. Five minutes later, he'd ring the bell. Uh, the na that group would leave. The next group would come in. And he gave away over 250,000 books that way. Now, the last time he did this was in 1969, and we were moving from the end of Washington Street to West Street, where we are now, and there were books left over at the end of the giveaway. And like I said, my father was a bit of a character and a showman, and if you can sort of imagine this, he hired a covered wagon with a cowboy and a horse team, and on the cover of the covered wagon it said, Go West, book lovers, go find West Street Brattle Bookshop. And they filled it up with books, and they drove her from the end of Washington Street near Boston City Hall, up Court Street, down Tremont by the Boston Common to where West Street is, and then back down Washington Street with my father sitting in back, throwing books out the whole way. Now, the superintendent in charge of traffic was a friend, told him he could do it all morning, but within an hour, the city was in an absolute standstill. They told him to stop. He didn't care. He had gotten his point across. And we've been on West Street since then. Now, when we first moved in, we were in a five-story, 150-year-old wooden building, absolutely crammed full of books. In February of 1980, I got a call at 4 o'clock in the morning. The building was on fire and it literally burned to the ground. I mean, it was 100% gone. But we wanted to continue to keep going, not go out of business. We found a storefront a few doors up the street. We rented folding tables. People either sold, gave us, or donated books. Kevin White, who was the mayor at the time, came down with a carload of books. And even though it was Amiga stock, within a month we reopened. The main thing, like I said, was just keep going. Over the next four years, we slowly but surely rebuilt the stock. Four years after that, we bought the building we're in now, which is sort of the old Dickensian type of store. The outside stands at a dollar, three and five, two floors of general use books, and then a third floor with rare books, autographs, manuscripts, first editions, leather bindings, and so on. And that type of business, the large, old, general, second-hand bookstore, is a dying business. And it's not dying because people don't like books, <coughs> buy books, read books, and so on. But particularly in the inner cities, property value has gone so high, that rent has gone so high, that old bookstores, which I can assure you are not the most efficiently run businesses in the world, one right after the other have gone out of business, and in the last few years, the internet has speeded that process along. Uh, now, like I say, we bought our buildings uh, in the early 80s, so I hope to do this for years to come. Uh, I've done this all my life. My parents say my first word was book. <laughs> uh, maybe it was. I'm sure they were talking about them all the time. And then I worked after school in elementary school, junior high school, high school, 
summers during college. I went to University of Massachusetts, got a degree in chemistry. I was going to go to Wisconsin to get a doctorate, but in 1983, I needed a year off. My father's health wasn't that good. That year now is over 40 years, and I don't regret for a minute that I'm doing this and not in a laboratory somewhere. Great. Now, if you would ask me what's one item that I'd like to find, and I know this is small, uh, it's a little pamphlet called Tamerlane by a Bostonian <laughs> done in 1827. Matter of fact, I was watching Jeopardy last night, and this was a question on Jeopardy. Uh, but in any case, by a Bostonian in 1827. And uh, the Bostonian who did this was Edgar Allan Poe. And it's his first book, and it's a classic rarity. A uh, matter of fact, the first copy to ever really show up was in the 1890s in a Boston book dealer's table for 10 cents. Another dealer spotted it there, bought a stack of books so it wouldn't show up. And in uh, 1890, sold it for $1,000. Then in the 1950s, there were two postmen in the New Bedford area who were book scouts. And being postmen, they knew where all the yard sales and book sales were. Bought a trunk of books. Bottom of the trunk was a Tamerlane. Families got involved. They got to negotiating. And after six months, they sold it for $10,000. Now, I don't know if it was worth it, because they started out best of friends. <laughs> By the time they sold it, they never spoke again. But they got their $10,000. And then about 15 years ago, an antique dealer in the Newburyport area died. Sole estate was auctions, paintings, prints, furniture, antiques, books as a group, $600 to an antique dealer in New Hampshire. They took all the pamphlets, put them in a box, $15 each. Someone, of course, picked out a Tamerlane. And, um, about 15 years ago, sold them for $198,000. Oh and one sold a couple of years ago for $800,000. And let me just say, this is a facsimile. Oh. Uh, a lot of them I bring them are original, but I don't bring million dollar pamphlets. But if any of you want to take a quick look and then go home and check your attic cellar space, if you find one, please give me a call. <laughs> A lot of the fun of collecting is learning about something, is studying, is appreciating it. It's really your knowledge that makes something interesting and thus fun. I mean, someone might look at something and say, oh, that's a scrap of paper. Someone else might say, that's a broadside that led to the Boston Tea Party, that led to the American Revolution, that led to our country's independence. So it's really that knowledge and understanding that makes things interesting and thus valuable. Now here's an item that on the surface I think is interesting, but the story behind it may be even more so. This is on White House stationery. It's dated April 11th, 1933, and it starts, Dear Jim, I want to send you this note to tell you how happy I am that you are to represent the United States in Poland. It's the most important post, etc., etc. Signed always sincerely, Franklin Roosevelt. And it's to the Honorable James Michael Curley, Mayor of Boston. <laughs> now, on the surface, this seems like a great honor. Well, Curley didn't think it was such an honor. Matter of fact, I think he thought Roosevelt was trying to get rid of him, which, of course, he probably was. And Curley's response to Roosevelt was, remember, this was 1933. He said, in Poland, with Germany on one side, Russia on the other, you should send your worst Republican enemy to Poland. He said, as a matter of fact, if you think it's so important, why don't you quit and go there yourself? <laughs> now, Curley's opinion of Washington didn't change over the years. We also have about 10 letters that he wrote to his wife when he was in Danbury Prison. Now, even though these were personal letters, he was still very much the politician. And there was one quote I particularly liked. He had just gotten into prison, and he wrote to his wife, and he said, Many of the four-legged creatures in my cell have more honor than the two-legged creatures in Washington. <laughs> there it is, and I'm not, uh, not Not everything we get are books, but we get all sorts of papers and magazines, brochures, and so on. Here's a program from the 1912 World Series, where the Red Sox played the Giants. The Red Sox won the World Series in 1912. They won again a few times in the teens, and then we had to wait a long, long, long time. And I guess this year didn't turn out that well either, although they were, they were fun. Not only, though, is it interesting as a baseball item, but on the back there's an ad for arrow shirts and collars. 
Collars are two for a quarter, shirts are a dollar and a half and two dollars. They're a little more expensive nowadays. It's also, uh, it's also become very popular to go on cruises and cruise ships. And I have a brochure here for a ship, tells you how wonderfully built, way to book passage, and anyone who wants to go on the Titanic, this is a, a brochure for it. And almost anything you can think of, there are people out there who are interested. There are whole societies of Titanic historians who do nothing but study the Titanic. And there's a tendency, though, whenever you talk about collecting or collecting books, or, or any type of collecting for that matter, that everything seems to be worth thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And I'd like to point out, not everything has to be high priced to be fun. Old Life magazines, here's one with Errol Flynn on the cover. Another with Elizabeth Taylor when she was 15 years old. And the large, large majority of these just sell for a few dollars. I mean, they're very common. There are a few exceptions, but the large majority are very cheap. We used to have a wall by a stairway at the store. We, we have a few hundred of the more famous light covers hanging there. People would stop and stare at that wall, sometimes a half an hour, an hour at a time, just lost in thought and memory. They loved them for the stories, the articles, the photographs. They made wonderful birthday or anniversary presents if you fell on the right day. As a matter of fact, we had one customer come in and he bought about 50 Life magazines from World War II. And it wasn't what he normally bought. So I said to him, why are you buying these? And he said he wanted to teach his children about World War II. And he thought a nice way to do it would be to get some of the old Lifes, look at a few of the photos, read a couple of the articles, and then discuss it with them. Sounded like a good idea to me. I was a little skeptical. But in any case, he came in a few weeks later. And I said to him, how's it going with the Lifes? He said, fabulously, but not the way I thought. He said, the kids don't care about the stories, the articles, the photographs, but they love the ads. And he says, and it turns out by looking at and discussing the ads with them, he could probably teach them more about what the United States was like during World War II than if they had read everything else anyways. I have a cookbook from the 1700s. Some of the recipes are wonderful. And then you have how to bake eels the common way. And I don't know if I want to bake them anyway, but that's beside me. One of the most interesting parts about the business for me is going out to houses and estates. That's how we get most of our books. It's almost like being Jim Hawkins on Treasure Island every day, never knowing what you're going to see, who you're going to meet, the people, the places, and so on. <laughs> and uh, I'll relate a few of those stories to you, and then after that, I'll see about some questions. This was a, a, a number of years ago. I was out of the store. I got back that a Mrs. Fisher had called and had some books. I called her up, and she said, yes, my father died in Providence. We have, 100, uh, we have 500 art reference books. We want to get the best price we can. We're inviting a number of dealers down to bid on them. Would you be interested? Well, 500 art reference books. Sounds like quite a good library. Providence is only an hour away from Boston. They lived on an old street called Benefit Street up near Brown University. I got to the house. It was a large, old colonial house. I got led through the house into a courtyard, into a garage. Second floor of the garage, they had 5,000 books. Well, it turned out her married name was Fisher. Her father's name was John Nicholas Brown. Ah. Family founded Brown University, one of the wealthier families in the country. And after six months negotiating, I bought about 80% of the books I wanted. I was happy. She was happy. And she said, my mother has a lot of books. <laughs> Most are being given to the university. Some are being sold at auction. But would you like to go to Newport to take a look at the books there? Well, their house in Newport is one of the mansions on the ocean. I mentioned this to my wife. She decided to come with me on this deal. <laughs> and one of the fascinating parts about it was being in one of those mansions that was still being lived in by a family, and at one point wandering from the basement to the attic, all on my own, without a tour guide saying, come here, go here, don't touch this, but just literally wandering through the whole place. It was fascinating. Another time I got called to Newport to do an appraisal. Now, when I come to groups like this, I do hundreds of free appraisals. Matter of fact, my goal is that whenever you think of an old book, 
you think of me and the Brattle Book Jar. I don't care if you think of 10 others. I have my cards here. We have 800 numbers, websites, whatever. But there are times when people need very formal written appraisals for insurance, estate taxes. Then I discuss a fee. But in any case, I got called to Newport, another mansion, not quite as big as the Browns. This was the Perry family. Commodore Perry, Oliver Hazard Perry. And what they had was a whole stack of papers from the War of 1812. During the war, their family were privateers. Well, they're privateers if you're on our side. They're pirates if you're on the other side. It's all the way you look at it. But it was the day-to-day -day accountings of the ships, and they were fascinating to read through. They would sometimes capture a ship and realize tens of thousands of dollars profit. In 1812, that was an incredible amount of money. Then one of the days, one of the ships got into a battle. The ship got hit. The captain got hit. He lost his leg. Three days later, there was a tiny entry at the bottom of a page, and it said, Captain, $5 bonus, loss of leg. And that was the last you heard of the captain. So that's changed a little now, too. Uh, when my father was still alive, and he died uh, over 35 years ago, uh, around 35 years ago, uh, we got a call from a lady. She was very va vague about her name, who she was, what she had. But it sounded like she might have some interesting things. She was relatively close by, so we went to her house. We got to the house. It was a little ranch house. Paint was peeling. Weeds were growing. You sort of say, oh, gee, what's going to be here? <laughs> she answered the door. She was quite elderly. We walk in, and there were just gorgeous antiques everywhere. I mean, really, really beautiful antiques. And she got to talking. She was originally from uh, the Boston area, but she had married the prince of the Ukraine, the cousin of the Tsar of Russia. He had escaped just before the revolution. And she told story after story about being Russian nobility in Europe, all the court intrigues, all the goings on, how T.E. Shaw used to stay at their house all the time, how she didn't think he accidentally died on a motorcycle. Uh, T.E. Shaw, of course, was Lawrence of Arabia. And she went on and on and on with these wonderful stories. Turned out her books were lousy. But the stories were absolutely <laughs> wonderful. And when we first got into a house, on one of the walls, she had 10 watercolors. They were probably pastoral European scenes, someone on that size. And when we first got in, I looked at them. I thought they were nice. And the longer she talked, and the more we were there, and the more I looked at them, the nicer I thought they were. And I finally said to her, you know, those 10 watercolors, they're really nice. And she sort of said, oh, yes, they're all Turners. So she had 10 original Turner watercolors, probably a million dollars worth of paintings. And it was like, oh, yes, you know, you know, you know like it's not, so you never know the people, the place, the characters. As a matter of fact, speaking of characters, about 15 years ago, we went to one of our customers' 100th birthday parties. Now, when you go to a man's 100th birthday party, and he tells you he just got back from Barcelona, he's going to have a talk in Florida, and he's been asked to lecture in Tokyo. And I finally said to him, wait a minute, you're a hundred years old. Don't you think Tokyo is an awfully long way to go? And he said, well, when I used to work, it took me well over 25 hours to get to Chicago. He says, I don't think Tokyo's a whole lot further than that now. <laughs> and here's a man who could tell you about one day sitting down to dinner with Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. And he was a young man at the time. He said he was really looking forward to this dinner. All the learning and insight he was going to get from these two great men. He said he was excited, so he got to the table a little early. Five minutes later, Ford came in and sat down next to him. And about 15 minutes later, Edison came in. Now, Edison was quite elderly, uh, very hard of hearing, had one of those big horns for hearing. He sat down opposite them. He said the first thing, Ford turned to Edison and yelled, My Tom, you look very good. And Edison turned to Ford and yelled, It's the Carter's Little Liver Pills. <laughs> this man said all night long, all they did was yell about Carter's Little Liver Pills. <laughs> and he said next time he wanted to learn something, he went to the library. <laughs> uh, I can go on and on and on with these stories. I'll tell one more, and then, um, and then maybe we can see about some questions. We get hundreds of phone calls at the store. People wanting to know, do you have a book? Can you get a book? How hard is it to get the book? Does the book exist? Or how much is it worth? What's the value? And so on. And most of those questions, either I or the people I work with, we can answer right off the top of our head. Some are a little bit more involved. Occasionally, you really have to do some research, but that can be 
fun. But every once in a while, you get a call that really stands out. And again, this was a while ago, a number of years ago. I answered the phone, hello, Brattle Bookshop, can I help you? Lady, elderly, very thick Irish bro. And the first thing she says is, President Kennedy slept with me. <laughs> well, you have to admit that gets your attention. And she thought the way for it to sink in. And then she went on to explain that she had worked for the Kennedy family. She had been his nursemaid. When he was three and four years old, he used to fall asleep in her eyes. So he did sleep with her, but it may be not what you first think. And what she had was a whole series of handwritten letters from the president. Now, presidential letters of any type have value. Handwritten letters from later 20th century presidents are very scarce, very valuable, and very high priced. She wanted to get an offer on them. I was skeptical about that, but I thought she'd be fun to meet. Went to a house. She was great. Wonderful stories. The letters were fabulous. I gave her what I thought was a tremendous offer on them. But much as I suspected, there was no way she could sell these letters. Letters were part of her life. Uh, I left a note behind. As far as I know, her family still has them. Probably where they belong, but who knows? Maybe someday. Uh, like I say, I can go on and on and on, but why don't I see if there are a few questions. And quite honestly, anything you ask me, I can go off in a tangent. Uh, <laughs> did you, way in the back. Oh, what about climates? Uh, climates are uh, Well, I'll tell you what. The question about Bibles, I actually end the talk talking about Bibles a little. I so, so I'm going to, yeah, well, you know it's a, a question that everybody asks about. So why don't I let that sit for a while, but at the very end, I'll talk about Bibles. Yes. Uh, what's the best way to store and preserve leather-bound books or vellum-bound? Well, the question is, what's the best way to store and uh, keep leather-bound, vellum-bound books? Why not just books? Uh, in general... I'm going to assume that most people here are not having a library that you're going to build a room in your house that at, that's atmospherically controlled with all sorts of alarms, with all sorts of special gas systems, and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars just in a room like that. I'm going to assume probably more average. Generally, if you're comfortable, the books will be comfortable. If it's not too hot, too damp, too cold, too dry, most of these books have lasted a long, long time. They'll probably last a whole lot longer than we will. It, you know, if you don't do anything to abuse them, they'll probably be fine. You don't want them in direct sunlight, because a lot of times, especially with leather-bound books, you'll see them in the, the spine is brown, but they might be red, blue, green on the side. They didn't make two-tone books. They just faded. Uh, with vellum-bound, you don't want it too dry, because it will bend a little. Also, you don't want to put them in a shelf too tight because inevitably somebody will pull it like that. You don't want them too loose because they'll, uh, you know, sort of bend. But quite honestly, uh, if, if you don't do something to hurt them, they'll probably be fine uh, and last for a long time. But it also gets into the question of if it is a problem and if there is some damage, what do you do? Uh, it's very expensive to fix books properly. I mean, a book, true book binder is a craftsman. They've got to pay the rent, send their kids to college, buy groceries. Uh, and there's no, if you've got a $5 book and you put a $100 repair in it, you've still got a $5 book. <laughs> if you've got a $5,000 book, well, maybe then putting a few hundred dollars to make it look nicer makes sense. And of course, the, then, so you judge that monetarily. On the other hand, you can judge it sentimentally. Maybe the old Bible that's been in the family for years and years and years. Uh, sentimentally, that might be priceless. So you don't judge how much it costs to fix it on a monetary value. You, you do it on that scale. So that's another way to look at it. But uh, in any case, anyone? Yes. Why is the dust jacket so important? The question is, why is the dust jacket so important? In the example I gave earlier where the dust jacket would add a few hundred dollars to the value. That can be ramped up. Uh, Great Gatsby, F. Scott Fitzgerald's classic, the first edition, without a dust jacket in good shape is a thousand to three thousand dollars. With a mint dust jacket, it's two or three hundred thousand dollars. So that means the dust jacket is actually worth two or three hundred thousand dollars. What it essentially comes down to <coughs> is 
people who collect books want them to be the best copy that they can possibly get. And people who can afford it will pay the best price to have the best collection. It, if I showed you a copy of a book, in general, that didn't have the jacket, and I showed you another copy of the same book that had the jacket, and you know, that was good, because jackets are made to be colorful, to be, you know, the idea is that they'll sell you the book. If I put two down next to each other and say to you, which would you prefer? Almost everybody would pick the one with the dust jacket. Almost everybody. There are people who don't like them and throw them away. But almost everybody would pick the more colorful, the better condition, the nicer copy. And then it just gets to be, how much would you pay to have that better copy? And when you get to the collectors who are passionate about what they'll do, they'll pay the best for the very perfect copy. I, I understand. But when you have a library and you remove the dust jacket and you see the binding, you see the color, linen or whatever Well, the, qu the question is, doesn't it look good that way? Except most books that have very nice dust jackets were very plain underneath. Yeah. And that's more and more so. So, and also people when they're collecting, not just dust jackets, but books or almost any type of collectible in general, want them as close to the original as they came out as they possibly can be. If you have a toy, they want the box. If you have a print, they want it in mint. So that's, it's all the same thing. Uh, I, I don't know if there are any questions out there. Uh, your book, are your yeah. books of any value? Your school yearbooks? Oh, the question is, are school yearbooks or yearbooks of any value? Well, in general, most of them are not. But they're almost, if you're looking for a particular school yearbook, boy, are they hard to find. <laughs> but if you have uh, the yearbook of, uh, I know at an Antiques Roadshow, someone had Ronald Reagan's yearbook that he signed to them. Another person had a yearbook of Allen Ginsberg, the poet. Uh, another per you know, so if you get a few special yearbooks, those can be valuable because of the people in the class, especially if they signed them and written in them. Also, if you get yearbooks that go back into the mid-1800s, college yearbooks, a lot of times they have original photographs of the professors of the college, Harvard in particular, and you start getting all sorts of original 1860s photographs of Harvard Square, Boston, uh, and a lot of the uh, students had their professors sign the photographs. So Longfellow, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and that. So there are exceptions. In general, though, if you said you had a, let's say, a Greenville High School yearbook from 1968, other than if you were in the Greenville High School class of 1968, probably yeah, so that's, that's what I'm at. I'll tell you what, at this point, why don't I do one or two appraisals? Did anyone bring a Bible? Yes, yes, right here. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, seriously. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll be, and did anyone bring a cloth uh, Victorian book with its very decorative cover? And the reason I'm asking for those has nothing to do with value. It has to do that they lead into stories. Uh, one of the fifth hint, you know. Okay. Did anyone bring a, a Victorian book that has a, a nice, and the, like I say, it's not, and if not, I just happen to bring one to tell the story. So, uh, the Bible I'll get out of here. Uh, but I'll tell you what, why don't I do this? Uh, well, first of all, let me say something about doing appraisals at a group. I'll, I'll use mine. It, it's a little easier to see. Uh, when I give prices at a group like this, I give a retail price. In other words, that price that you would pay if you came into my store or a store like mine, it is not what you would get if you're selling the book. Usually, if you're selling the book, you expect about a third to two-thirds of the retail. If you're dealing with very low-priced items, the percentages might even go up. When you get to very expensive items, they can change again. A number of years ago, I bought a copy of Audubon's Quadrupeds. Not the birds, but the animals, but the big, huge thing. And at the time I bought that one, I paid $100,000 for it. I sold it within two weeks for $105,000.
That's only a 5% markup, but it's $5,000. Yeah. Well worth the time and effort I spent, and I pretty much had it pre-sold before I even bought it. So if you get to the much, much higher values, especially if something will turn over quickly, the percentages can come down just because of the amounts of money involved. Mm -hmm. Also, everything I say is subjective. In other words, the fact that I say something's worth $100 doesn't mean a colleague of mine doesn't say a hundred and a quarter, and another colleague say 75. So if you get something, you have it, you know what you have, you get a price, you're happy, wonderful. But if you're not sure, get a second, third, fourth, fifth opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> uh, the first book I have here, uh, sometimes people ask if I collect books, and generally I don't, but there's this one collection and it has to do with dust jackets, it's sort of peripherally. Uh, dust jackets actually started in the early 1800s, but the dust jackets as we know them uh, was more around World War I. Dust jackets used to be literally simple pieces of paper to keep the dust off the new books. Around uh, World War I, the printing process came such that they could make very decorative dust jackets and so on. But before that, they would have books sometimes with very decorative covers. Mm -hmm. And people collect books just for the decorative covers. And one of the reasons they had decorative covers like this was that if the book caught your eye when you walked in the bookstore, more chance that you buy it. But you can go to yard sales, book sales, library sales, historical society <coughs> sales, bookstores, auctions, whatever, and a lot of times you can get these kind of books very, very cheaply. There are some that are very expensive, and individually, they might not seem like much, but as a collection, graphically, they can be quite nice. And like I said, I have a collection like this myself that started off as a bit of a joke. One day I got a book in and had a picture of a toilet on the cover. <laughs> the title of the book was Flushed with Pride, The Life of Thomas Crapper. <laughs> in any case, I got it, I brought it home, showed it to my wife, she took one look at it and said, we have to put this in the bathroom. So we did. A couple of days later, I got another book that had a big eye on the cover, a big eye staring out of it. The title was We Never Sleep. It was a history of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. But with a big eye staring at you, I thought, ah, put that in the bathroom too. Now, this is a little half bathroom. So there's no shower, no steam. Next thing you know, we built bookshelves. And now we have three or 400 of these Victorian-style uh, books in our bathroom. Uh, people walk in, there's loads of reading material. But one of the rules of the collection is that nothing can be valuable, because you can imagine when one falls off the shelf where it ends up. Uh, I like to end the talk talking about Bibles. And one of the reasons I like to do that is the Bible is the most commonly printed book of all time. It always has been, probably always will be. And we sometimes get five and 10 calls a week with people who have 100, 200 year old family Bibles. And in almost all those cases, we have to say to them, if this is your family Bible and it's been handed down generation to generation, sentimentally, it's priceless. Monetarily, it might not be worth that much. <coughs> now, when you get to these old, Victorian Bibles with the beautifully embossed covers. I'm not going to open this because it's a little loose, but this is around the 1870s, 1880s. In mint condition, these can be worth $100 to $300 because they make wonderful gifts for ministers, priests, divinity students, whatever. But once one hinge goes, one binding breaks, one class comes off, they lose all of that value. Uh, is this your family's Bible? No, yeah. I work for a church, and like you said about um, estate sales, when someone's mother dies and they're cleaning out her house, they don't want to throw a Bible away. <laughs> you'll actually, you'll actually enjoy my very last story. Then. <laughs> but in any case, this one is probably worth ten or twenty dollars uh, because of the condition. Now, sometimes in the beginning, middle, or end of these Bibles, there's um, family histories. And uh, those can be invaluable to the local historical or genealogical society. But many times, they just want to Xerox out that page, maybe the title page. They don't want the whole Bible. And uh, 
Matter of fact, one of the things that came up in the introduction is that I praised for Antiques Roadshow. And yes, they did do a show I was appraising last week. It was a repeat type of show. Uh, but I've done it for a number of years. And the way that show works is, and actually they're changing format a little next year. They're going to do them in mansions and smaller venues. But the way it works right now is you do it on a Saturday in a convention center. Uh, and you appraise from 7.30 in the morning till 8 or 8.30 at night, pretty much nonstop. Uh, and you have three book appraisers at a table next to the music appraisers, next to the jewelry, next to so on, in a big circle. There's about 5,000 people who come to a show. Each person has two items. There's about 10,000 items that get appraised. They take about 50 or 60, which makes up the three hours of television that you see at night. Uh, in any case, though, as appraisers, we've got to be there even before 7.30. And there was one uh, show that I was talking to the other appraisers, and we were saying, how many Bibles do you think we'll see today? <laughs> and so we counted. We, about 80 of these type Bibles of different sizes in one show in one day. As a matter of fact, now, depending on who the other appraisers are, sometimes we have a little pool going. Uh, <laughs> and so on. Uh, I like to end the talk talking about Bibles, uh, and I'll tell one last story. Uh, and this fits a little into both of the questions. I had to do an appraisal a number of years ago at a large old church in Boston, well over a hundred year old church. And uh, they had a huge library and they wanted me in there to see if they had any valuable books. Well, I spent a day there. They actually had some great books. It was a lot of fun. At the end of the day, the priest said to me, could you come down to the basement? There were some more books. I looked at the books there. And then there was this closet. I mean, it was probably take up the corner. A small room, large closet, not nearly as high as this. Priest opened the door, front to back, floor to ceiling, top to bottom. It was stuffed with thousands of old Bibles. And I looked at the priest and I said, what is this? He says, well, people hate to throw away a book. <laughs> they feel it's sacrilegious to throw away a Bible. So what happens when a parishioner dies and the family doesn't want the Bible? They come and they present it to the church. And he says, what do we do? We very graciously accept it. We don't want to offend anybody. Then we go downstairs, open the door, go in with the rest of them. And he says, and we can't drive a dumpster up to the back of the church and fill it full of Bibles. That just wouldn't be right. So I use it as an example to say that if you want to give something to a charity, ask them if they want it first. If they want it, they can use it, great. If not, you're really not doing anyone a favor. In any case, I'm going to end in just a, a minute. Like I say, I have my cards. Don't ever feel that you're uh, bothering myself, the people I work with. We'd rather have 100 people call with nothing special than have the 100 first person say, I just threw away a Tamil. <laughs> now, the way I do the appraisals is I do them more in a crowd scene. Uh, quite honestly, the less organization there is, the faster it goes. Now, I don't do it to the whole audience. I'll end the formal part. I hear that you have refreshments out there. Uh, probably if we just did a line coming sort of this way because the refreshments will be out that way. If anybody has a big pile of books to appraise and there's a line, I might only do one or two and then ask you to go to the end of the line. Uh, I'll do them all, but and so on. If somebody wants to stand over my shoulder or sort of hear what I'm saying, I have no problem with that, but I don't do it formally because actually this is a really large, good crowd. We'd be here all night, and I want to get home. Uh, <laughs> what? Can you answer a general question? One more, yeah. Why, um, are, it looks like gold on the edges of the yeah. pages. Is what Why? Reason? Well, first of all, it is gold. It is. it is gold. It's just it's so thin that it, it makes the book look prettier and more special. And so the publishers feel that it sells more. Does so it protect the pages? It doesn't particularly protect anything. It just makes it look fancier and they charge more. But if the gold's of no, you can't scrape the gold off. <laughs> All right, so I'll say thank you very much. Uh, <laughs>
Thank you.